knowledge and information. This is the theme of this year's edition of Global Access. The importance of knowledge has been evident to man since the beginning of time. But the Information Society presents new questions. How does the increasingly intense flow of information affect our ability to maintain a holistic understanding of the world? And does it actually make us smarter or dumber? Brendan O'Neill is editor of the British Spiked magazine and has written extensively on the conformism and censorship mentality which he believes increasingly affects our academic institutions. In conversation with Thomas Geer, O'Neill points out the intellectual and political problems that come with self-imposed immaturity. There is a trend in academia in the West uh, of you know, self-censorship, you could always call it, or, or censorship, or, and, and, and policing uh, what is expressed and even sometimes what is thought. And mm. so this is a, this is a, it, sometimes this is described as a political correctness tendency from, from, from left-wing activism, but I, I guess you object to that uh, explanation. I think that's a very simplistic explanation. Mm. I think the problem is far deeper, far more profound, and far more historic in terms of how long it's been going on for. But we certainly have a situation where today it can be more difficult to say something on campus than it is to say it anywhere else in society, which is the opposite of how it should be, which is that the university has traditionally been a place where you could have thought experiments, where you could take intellectual risks, where you could push the boundaries of knowledge in potentially new ways. That's what the university is supposed to be about. And, and I guess that that's creates changed. a bit, yeah, and I get, and that creates a bit of, of a confusion, doesn't it? Because mm -hmm. you think of the academia as a place where ideas meet ideas and then and they, 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 they struggle on, on, on with, with blank weapons and, and mm. then this, the decisiveness gives on if it's evidence-based or if it could be falsified or not. And yes, this, it's, <laughs> a, it's a real problem because mm if you cannot have, you know, university teaching, university learning is by definition conflictual because you are challenging pe young people's prejudices, you are shaking everything they think they know out of their heads and introducing them to new ideas and new forms of knowledge, you are provoking them, you are antagonising them. You, you know, university learning without conflict is not really university learning at all. And this is a point that um, many great thinkers have made throughout history, you know, Cardinal John Henry Newman, the great British Catholic thinker of the late um, 90, late 1800s, early 1900s, he made the point that the human intellect does from opposition grow. So it's only through having our ideas and our, our dogmatic beliefs challenged, whether it's through evidence or facts or, or, or knowledge or, or myth or whatever it might be. But what patterns do we see then? Where the new patterns? But what, what, how do they express themselves? Well, I think they express themselves in numerous different ways. I think there are two. There are many different forms of censorship on campus. I think a lot of it comes from students themselves who um, now want to live in what they refer to as a safe space. And a safe space is uh, an ideological idea, really, which is that there are certain areas and certain zones on campus where you cannot say certain things, where you cannot sell certain newspapers, where even where you cannot play certain songs. There's a song by Robin Thicke called Blurred Lines, which is a sexually themed pop song, which has been banned by 30 student unions in Britain because it's allegedly offensive to women. So they're even controlling not only um, ideas, but also newsprint, music, all forms of culture is really being clamped down on in these so-called safe spaces. But shouldn't there be safe spaces in that sense? I mean, safe spaces where you do not have to hear misogynic or, or homophobic or, or racialist uh, discourse or, or slurs. I don't think so. I think people should have physical safety. No one should feel under physical threat. No one should be assaulted or harassed. I think those are crimes, justifiably so. But intellectual safety or a feeling of moral safety is not something that anyone should enjoy. But, I mean, uh, racial slur slurs are not intellectual discourse. No, of are course. They? But the problem with the uh, expansion of censorship on campus is that what's defined as racist expands all the time. So it's not simply someone going 
onto campus and saying the N-word, for example, which we would all frown upon, and none of us would defend that as a useful or intellectual exercise. Um, but also, if you are a speaker from outside of the university who thinks mass immigration has gone too far, you can be branded racist and therefore banned from campus. Or if you are Jermaine Greer, the very famous feminist who thinks that a man cannot become a woman, that it's impossible for a man to become a woman, she is branded transphobic and therefore she can be banned. Or if you are someone who is critical of the institution of gay marriage, for instance, you're religious, you're a Muslim, or you're a Christian, say, and you fully support gay rights, but you don't like the idea of gay marriage, you can be branded homophobic and banned from campus. So the problem is the ever-expanding definition of these prejudices so that they encapsulate more and rather incorporate more and more forms of speech and belief which to some people are simply their moral convictions so that's the problem well if we should accept your description could we just say that this is a kind of a snowflake generation they are um, most most of them are maybe single children and 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 uh, from and from families with only one child and always ready to get their will through and, and uh, a spoiled <laughs> spoil so generation bad. of brats um, and they are, they are so sensitive about any kind of transgression which they or, or see as a transgression. Yeah, I don't like the term snowflake because I think it, it emphasizes too much the fragility of millennials and this new generation of 18 and 19 and 20 year olds. I certainly do think these people exhibit a fragile personality. I think they uh, they have a sense of victimhood, a sense of they're easily wounded by words and ideas, but I'm more interested in how they came to be like that. And it didn't just happen overnight. They didn't just wake up and say, oh, I'm going to be mortally offended by everything I hear today. I think what the real problem is, is the, the way in which these young people were socialized and the way in which adult society itself has lost the ability to encourage the young to embrace adulthood and to embrace independence independence and to um, discover their own autonomy. So instead, we live in a society which continually sends the signals to young people that their self-esteem is fragile, that certain ideas are destructive and dangerous, that if they ever get bullied in the playground, it's the end of the world and they'll never survive. So we deprive them of the opportunities to practice their autonomy, to practice their adulthood. And, you know, surprise, surprise, when they get to the age of 18, they're not actually adults because they've never had that journey. So I think a lot of this falls on the, 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 the process of socialization that children no ga- now go through, which is the opposite of what it used to be. It used to be encouraging the young to fumble their way towards being adults. And now what it is, is encouraging them to be adolescents right through to the age of 30. And that's why I think they get to campus and they are quite weak and unable to deal with conflict even at an intellectual level. But then, I, I guess that's in a way of... Um, adulthood means also that you lose your fear of different thinking or, or, mm. or daring thinking, which they don't quite reach then. Um, is, that, is, that, is, that the, uh, is that how adulthood could be described in a way, that if you're an adult, you are also ready to listen to other, po- yes. other views? And, and I think that's right. Uh, I think um, part of being an adult or, or part of... Um, becoming a kind of autonomous, independent individual is that you are capable of negotiating public life and political life without needing, you know, the infrastructure of censorship to protect you from certain ideas. You know, we assume that adults, or we have historically assumed, particularly in the enlightened period, we assume that adults are capable of deciding for themselves what is a good idea and what is a bad idea. And that's one of the marks of adulthood. One of the marks of adulthood is that unlike a child, you don't need to have TV shows switched off to protect you. You don't need to be have certain books hidden away from you. You don't need to be protected from the man who says evil things on the street corner. We do that for children because we don't want children to be harmed or, or damaged by ideas or images we think they're not ready for. But one of the marks of adulthood is that you are then ready for that. You You are ready to deal with that and you're ready to decide for yourself what to think about these ideas and these images. Increasingly, adults seem incapable of doing that. And that, I think, is another expression of the ever-expanding um, category of childhood so that when people go to university now, they might be legally adults, but increasingly they are still morally children. Some of the effects uh, are, I guess, this what you have... Mm, 
um, given the term which was uh, quite new for me. I had to even to look it up how it's pronounced and it's self-imposed knowledge, which knowledge. means the knowledge, which also means, means non-age in a sense yes. of, of being still immature. So it's a self-imposed immaturity in a way. Yes, um, so whenever I say the word knowledge, people always mishear me as saying knowledge. Mm -hmm. But so mm -hmm. knowledge in many ways is the opposite of knowledge. Knowledge is uh, immaturity, a self-imposed immaturity as you say. And, and that phrase self-imposed knowledge actually comes from Kant and Kant's famous essay, What is Enlightenment? And he argued that enlightenment is simply um, taking adult responsibility for your own life and for your own decisions and for your own exercise of moral reason and free will. And he made the point, you know, his essay, What is Enlightenment, could actually be written now about the political systems we live under. He said he, you know, people are tired of having a book that thinks for them and a pastor who decides what their spiritual outlook should be and a dietitian who tells them what to eat. He says, we are surrounded by these people who are constantly instructing us on how to live and constantly telling us that life without their instruction would be virtually impossible and maybe even dangerous. And his argument was that being enlightened simply means breaking free of these instructors, or as he called them, guardians, and deciding for yourself. And we increasingly don't encourage young people to do that. Which means, uh, which I guess leads to uh, what, what, what has been termed as intellectual dependency, in mm. the sense that, that you are always dependent on, uh, on, on authorities of telling you that you should, you, or, or, or also asking them, please do protect me from these. That's right. I, I think people often forget that the Enlightenment, that great period of experimental thinking and, and, and the arguments for freedom, um, was very anti-authority. It was based on challenging expertise. Uh, you know, the uh, scientific, um, the Royal Society in London, which was a great Enlightenment scientific body, its motto was, on the word of no one. So the idea was that you wouldn't rely on the words or ideas or guidance of other people, but you would um, discover for yourself, often through a process of trial and error, what was the best way to view the world and what was the best way to live your life. So that's what the Enlightenment was traditionally about. It was about not relying on experts, not being dependent on priests or kings or princes to tell you how to think and how to live, but rather discovering it for yourself. And we've had a complete reversal of that now in towards a counter-enlightenment, where we have these new cast of experts, uh, often therapeutic experts, who pose as people who have to erect this scaffolding around our lives and protect us from everything and, and tell us how to live. So the process of um, self-discovery and uh, self-autonomy is entirely discouraged now in favour of new forms of guardians who tell us how to think and how to live. But that's only one part of the story, isn't it? I mean, uh, we spoke about uh, self-imposed knowledge and, and young people or adults not wanting to reach adulthood and then they are coming to the university. But then and nobody's uh, obviously there is there is also the other part the university itself which mm. obviously then in a way uh, acknowledges their yes. uh, fragility and try and, and and gives nobody says to them you need here you have to grow up i mean one of my experiences in, in in when i was in the military service was that i was a bit older than some of the guys because i became uh, was a recruit later was that some of them actually were like 18 19 and haven't hadn't made their bed once mm. and then and then and, and Actually, the officers, the company the officers said to them, now, guys, you have to learn to make your own bed. You have to, now, now it's your responsibility, not your mother's. Yes. So somebody doesn't tell them, actually, in the campus, then now you are, you, you can't be this fragile. You have to grow up. So uh, there's, the, of course, the other side is obviously that. Absolutely those, right. And mm. what the university does, it completely plays into this um, self-imposed knowledge that the, the young people are socialized into and exacerbates it. So it will continue send the signal to students, particularly new freshers students, freshmen, um, that they are, that university is going to be incredibly difficult, that they will probably suffer from exam-related stress, that they will probably
probably experience a mental illness while they're on campus. I mean, these, this is how students are instructed from the very first week they're at campus. And recent surveys have shown that in Britain and other Western countries as well, the number of young people who claim to be suffering from a form of mental ill health is rising all the time, which is not which doesn't make sense because in many ways these people's lives are far easier than their parents and their grandparents were and yet they are convinced that they are suffering from anxiety, stress and mental ill health and even from post-traumatic stress disorder which was traditionally something that only people who'd been through war and horror suffered from but now you will find a 19-year-old student at the University of Oxford who claims to have post-traumatic stress disorder because he once got slapped when he was 15 years old. Utterly bizarre. But universities, um, they validate that script and continually. And why do they do that? I think they do that because this is, as you say, the other side of the equation, which is that universities have all also lost sense of what their mission was and they've lost confidence in what their tradition in what their mission traditionally was which was to um, invite adults onto their campuses and allow them to experiment intellectually and discover the world through these um, teachers and, and educators and so on. And universities now increasingly see themselves partly through a process of um, the instrumentalization of education. So edu higher education is now increasingly seen as a means to get a job rather than as a means to explore the world and expand your mind. But also because I think universities have become cautious of controversy, reluctant to allow the expression of difficult ideas, and um, nervous about what traditionally they tried to do, which was to push the boundaries of knowledge further and further. So you're absolutely right. It's, it's, a, it's a dual situation where young people come to university and they're not actually adults yet because of the socialization process we currently live under. And then the university brings them on board and says, you're going to be weak and fragile and this is going to be really difficult for you. And as a consequence, what you end up with is a new generation of students who feel and often are ill-equipped for the very adult pursuit of discovering knowledge. <laughs> and how did we come to all this? How did it all happen? Well, that's the million-dollar question mm. in many ways. I think it's, a, it's been a long and complicated process, but I think what's happened over the past 40 or 50 years is that Western society has lost faith in its own history, traditions, and values. And that expresses it in itself in many different ways. There's a, there's a real sense of self-loathing among Western societies cultural now. Cultural relativism. Cultural yes, relativism, mm -hmm. postmodernism, a reluctance to say that there is any such thing as truth, um, the idea that all truths are equally valid, all ways of life are equally valid, the multicultural idea that all cultures are equally valid. Continually, Western society sends the message that there's nothing really special about Western society. There's nothing special about the Enlightenment, and in fact, the Enlightenment probably gave rise to Nazism. That's the latest intellectual prejudice. Um, and it sends the message that the West is pretty awful, actually, and has committed terrible historic crimes, and we should whip ourselves on the back in, in uh, apologetics for these crimes for the rest of time. But in, and a sense, in a sense, some of it is, after all, true, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the, the, the British Empire, I come from Britain, the British Empire was horrendous and deprived vast numbers of people of the right to govern their own nations and govern their own affairs. There's, there's no question about that, in my mind, anyway. But I think there's a difference between having a historical reappraisal of the empire, which I'm absolutely in favor of, and using the experience of empire to continually do down Britain and British history and the very idea of being a British citizen. There's a difference between those two things. And what I think we continually have these days is the growth of national self-loathing um, and the uh, a real estrangement between Western societies and the values upon which they are built, which are not all bad values. They also include the birth of democracy, the struggle for freedom of speech, the struggle for press freedom, all these great historical leaps forward, which tend to be rubbished in the process of rubbishing our past. So uh, as a consequence, universities, which were traditionally, the, the, in many ways, the guardians of past knowledge, the guardians of history, the guardians of who we are and where we come from, they become increasingly confused as to what their mission is, and they don't know. And 
as a consequence, one of the new missions they've made for themselves is basically to be kindergartens for overgrown children and to be um, dispensers of therapy to these 19-year-old children rather than the um, protectors of knowledge for 19-year-old adults. And I think that's the shift we're seeing on campus. Is it really that bad? I mean, that you can t t speak about like 19 year old children so. is it that bad yes and no mm -hmm. it's that bad in the sense that these things really are happening mm -hmm. and I've seen them with my own eyes I've seen students yeah, you've written extensively about yes it. and yeah. you know I've given speeches I gave a speech at Oxford this year and a student actually had a physical meltdown and, and was physically hyperventilating in response to something I said. Um, it must I must have been something very upsetting. It was, I thought it was a really normal thing. I was criticizing the idea of um, rape culture. Hmm. And I said, uh, the, my problem with the term rape culture is it con conflates a crime rape with a non-crime culture and I think that opens the door to censorship so I explained why I have a problem with this term and this young student hyperventilated and actually had to be helped out of the room because she couldn't breathe and that's an, a really strange almost religious form of um, intolerance of different ways of thinking and that's so so that's one example I've seen many other mm. examples so in answer to your question, it's, it's bad because it really is happening and it really is having an impact on university life. It's not so bad in the sense that this doesn't extend to all young people. No. It doesn't extend to all students and it doesn't extend to all campuses. And in fact, the evidence suggests that in Britain and America in particular, it's the more upper class universities, the Russell Group universities as we call them in Britain or the Ivy League universities as they call them in the US, where these things are happening most of all. Whereas in the newer post-1960s, largely working class universities, this problem is not so pronounced. That's so there's, there's That's a very... an interesting pattern, isn't it? Yeah, there's yeah. a very interesting class mm. difference, there's a very interesting cultural difference. So it's bad, but it's not the end of the world. Mm. And <clears throat> speaking about remedies, uh, because we, I guess you think that uh, you, one needs to move forward. We can't just have universities that are kindergartens for mm. grown-ups. Uh, a couple of remedies have been discussed, and I think you also uh, refute them, or at least say that they are not enough in a sense of more like evidence-based thought and scientific reason that has to be reintroduced. Aren't, they, aren't those good ideas? They are good ideas, but I, my concern with the pushback against this new censorious culture is that we are creating a new form of... Um, intellectual dogma. So I think what we've seen on campus in recent decades is a calling into question of scientific truth, a calling into question of reason, and the rise of postmodernism, post-structuralism, um, media studies, cultural studies, queer studies, all these things which actually call into question the idea of truth itself. And those have been pretty bad developments, and I would criticize all of them for the most part. But I think the push back against that now, although I welcome the pushback, my concern with it is that it is um, a, a narrow defense of scientific reason rather than what I consider to be the core idea of the Enlightenment and ideally of university life itself, which is moral reason, which is a very different thing because scientific reason is... You have to elaborate on that in a sense. Well, mm. if we, you, know, people, you know, people like Steven Pinker and other defenders of the Enlightenment tend to, even though I think they do a very good job of it and a very important job, they tend to think of it in terms of scientific truth, um, whereas a large part of the Enlightenment was about defending moral reason. So that's somewhere between scientific reason and moralism. Moralism is bad because it pushes aside scientific reason and just says everything's morality. But I think scientific reason on its own is also bad because it pushes aside the need ever to make a moral judgment. And what moral reason says is that you should make a moral judgment about the best course for your life or the best course for society and ideally your moral judgment should be based on reason so it should be based on your understanding of the world your experience of the world and facts as well and and that 
ideal of moral reason, which is what Kant writes about in what is enlightenment, I think is the thing that gets lost from both sides. So I think both the uh, promoters of the idea that there's no such thing as truth, so the new kind of politically correct brigade, and also the defenders of truth, but only in the narrow sense of scientific truth, both sides miss out on what was a core outlook of the modern enlightened Western society, which is the belief that ordinary people could be reasoned through the exercise of moral reason and the exercise of free will. And I'm worried that that's getting lost in this battle. But, but, but concretely, if, if, if the moral reason or, or, and the idea of moral reason from the Enlightenment was to be applied in this particular situation, what type of recommendations and what type of change would that lead to? It would lead to complete and utter unfettered freedom of speech. Mm. And this is another... Oh, yeah, because that is that is not a scientific uh, no. thesis, isn't it? It's a, it's a moral thesis that exactly. everyone has. Yeah, It's a moral thesis, and mm. you know, I'm sure you could make a scientific argument against freedom of speech. I'm sure you could draw a pie chart or a graph and mm. demonstrate that freedom of speech has problems. But that's not the point. The point is that it's a moral ideal, and it's one that I think we have to take incredibly seriously. And, and coming back to Kant and what is enlightenment, he ends his essay by saying, well, how do you exercise moral reason? How do you become enlightened? And then he has this wonderful line, he says, all it takes is freedom. Because when you have freedom, you are compelled to think for yourself. Because you're not being instructed, you're not being told what's the right way to view the world, you're not being protected from certain ideas and certain words and certain images. You're not having the world um, explained to you by people who are supposedly better than you. Instead, you have to negotiate it and understand it for yourself. So I think the in, in the question of what would the university look like if it were to start taking moral reason seriously again, it would look like a place where there was no safe spaces, absolutely no censorship of external speakers, no restrictions on what um, lecturers could experiment with in relation to their students in terms of ideas, and instead would be a completely free place and it's only under the banner of freedom that people are encouraged and in fact must exercise their moral reason and decide for themselves what is right and what is wrong. 